of every creature is really wonderful but uh, there is something particularly special about the human nervous system. This year I've been a visiting fellow at Clare Hall College, Cambridge University and working on a project using engineering principles to understand biological systems and one of the really enjoyable projects I've been working on is looking at the human nervous system. If you're not sure what that project means, what it means is enjoying studying God's creation. <laughs> so what are the challenges of a wiring system? The human nervous system is like a huge uh, wiring system that connects the brain with all the parts of the body to enable the brain to control the body and to pick up sensing and such a wiring system is a great challenge. Uh, if you take, for example, a spacecraft, uh, it has an incredible wiring system. In fact, I was responsible for doing most of the wiring on this Metop C spacecraft launched in 2018. I did about 30 kilometres of wiring and it was very difficult to integrate it with all of the subsystems, the structures, the mechanisms, getting the wire from one place to another to connect it to the computer. Uh, this is a picture of the computer and you can see lots of wires coming out of the computer to control motors and you can see lots of wires going into the computer that's detecting uh, various measurement sensors, uh, wires going into the computer and it's a great challenge to funnel all the wires into the computer and funnel wires out of the computer to reach every part of the spacecraft. I know how challenging that is from first-hand experience. But that's exactly what happens with the human body. I have a picture of the human body here with the peripheral nervous system uh, which reaches every part of the body. But then you have the brain which is like the computer of the body. Here we call it the central nervous system with the spinal cord. And just like that spacecraft computer, you have many motor signals coming out of the brain and you've got lots of uh, sensor signals going into the brain. So you have this incredible wiring system connecting the brain to every part of the body. And having done wiring on a spacecraft, I've been absolutely fascinated and intrigued to know how the wiring is done in the human body. How did God wire up the human body? That's what I've really wanted to know. So in the first part, just to mention a few staggering uh, statistics about the performance of the human nervous system. Well, I've mentioned the spacecraft, uh, and I mentioned that I did about 30 kilometers of wiring on a spacecraft. That sounds quite a lot, doesn't it? about 500 motors, about a thousand sensors on a spacecraft. Well, if you take something even bigger, say an aircraft carrier, uh, you have about 5,000 kilometers of wiring. That's a lot of wiring to do, isn't it? 5,000 motors, 10,000 sensors. So how does that compare to the human body? Do you think the human body is going to have as much wiring as an aircraft carrier, well, let's look at the statistics. In the case of the human body, the length of wiring is 150,000 kilometers, absolutely dwarfs an aircraft carrier, and we're not as big as an aircraft carrier, obviously. So it's a staggering amount of wiring. We have about 500,000 what are called motor units in our body, now you might think, uh, hang on there, I thought there were just 600 muscles in the human body. Well, that's true, but every muscle has a large number of motor units. And the number of motor units flying down your spinal cord is about 500,000. I'll, I'll mention more about that later. So how many sensors do you think are in the human body? Uh, in an aircraft carrier, about 10,000. In the body, it's something like 10 million sensors. Just in your skin alone you have 3 million sensors, but you have a lot of sensors inside your body, nerve sensors, temperature sensors and so on. It's not known exactly how much, but it's, it's going to be more than 10 million. 
Now, when I found out these staggering statistics, I thought, hang on a minute, how does God get millions of these wires up the spinal cord to the brain? This is an incredible feat of engineering. Um, so that's the colossal size. Then we have a sense of, an incredible sense of touch on our skin. I was mentioning earlier, skin is one of the things that makes humans unique and special. We have sensors packed into our skin. And not only that, but our brain knows where every single sensor is. It knows where every one of those three million sensors in are on the body. It has like a map in the brain. So this cross section here is showing you just a couple of millimeter squared cross section of skin, a tiny amount of skin. You can see the sensors are packed in there. Temperature sensor, hot sensor, cold sensor, um, pain sensor, pressure sensors. Near the surface you have different kinds of pressure sensors for light touch. Deep in the, in the skin you have heavy touch. There are thought to be at least four types of pressure sensors in the skin. And it has been discovered our fingertips can feel a ridge of 13 nanometers in height. That's 0.0013 millimeters. That's not very big. But it gives us a tremendous sense of touch. Our sense of touch is one of those senses that we tend to take for granted. I'm, I'm sure we take our hearing for granted as we've been hearing uh, the wonder of hearing in the earlier talk. But our sense of touch in particular is something that we tend to take for granted. One of the staggering things about our skin is this. If you have your bare arm to one side, you're not looking at your arm. If you have a fly about a millimeter in length, weighing about the, the weight of a grain of sand, it lands on your arm, your brain will tell you there is something landing on your arm. Even though Every split second, your brain is getting millions of pieces of information, something like 15 million pieces of information. It will tell you that one of the hairs on your hand has been disturbed by something, probably a fly, and you should just look at your arm. So you look at your arm and you say, oh, there's a little fly and you, you flick it off. How come you can feel a fly on your arm and your brain tells you, which is the other miracle, if you look at this uh, if you look at this picture here, if you look at the hair, at the bottom of the hair you can see nerves wrapping around the root of the hair. So when the hair is slightly disturbed by a fly, the nerves at the root of the hair get tugged and a signal goes to your brain and your brain says, the bottom of your arm, a little fly has just landed on top of that hair or something's just landed on top of your Hair. You know, in the Bible it says God has numbered the hairs on our head. He's designed every hair with its own lubrication, its own nerve uh, connection. It's quite staggering, the sensitivity of our skin. So we have an amazing sense of touch, amazing senses around our body. But we also have an amazing control of force. I work in... Uh, some of the work I do is in a robotics lab. I work with people designing robots. It's very hard to design a robot to hold an egg or a tomato. In fact, tomatoes are the hardest thing to hold. They tend to get squashed and ruined. But your hand is so sensitive and has such fine control that you can hold really delicate things. And the reason for that is the fact that not only do you have wonderful muscles, but your muscles are split into separate motor units, and each one of the motor units has a separate nerve controlling it. So the body has, is something between 600 to 700, depending how you define muscles, but we have about 500,000 motor units, and that means that we can control our force. So you can have a strong fist or a very delicate fist. You can play the piano with delicate notes or hard notes. But what is interesting is if a muscle has a hundred motor units, it doesn't mean that it can produce one hundredth the force. It can actually produce 
one thousandth of the force. And the reason is that every muscle is broken down into motor units. The motor units are deliberately a variety of size. You have big motor units and very small motor units, deliberately so that you can make super small, fine forces. And on top of that, the brain knows which is the small motor unit and the big motor unit. So if you try to make a very small force with your arm or your finger, your brain knows to go to the little motor units before the big motor units. And not only that, but if you do a, a push of something, your brain triggers the units in sequence so that you don't get a sudden rush of force, but you get a very gradually controlled force. So the control of our muscles is a really remarkable uh, thing. I'll just give an ex my favourite example of muscles in the human body. And they are two muscles in the iris of your eye, a lovely blue iris here. And the, there are muscles in that iris. In fact, those strands that you can see, this is why I've got this particular picture, those strands are motor units. So you can see lots of radial strands. Each radial, there's a, over a hundred here, and they are motor units. That's one muscle. Uh, that outer one is one muscle, but it contains over a hundred motor units. Each one is 0.1 millimetre in diameter, and each one, this is the point I want to make, each one has a nerve controlling it. So your eyeball is full of nerves connected to each motor unit. So, uh, for those of you interested, you have these two muscles in the eye. You have the radial muscle, the, uh, that's the iris dilator muscle that opens the pupil in dark light. So in dark light, you can open the central hole, the pupil, and it's pulled out by those radial, and in fact it's the radial muscles you can see in the picture, uh, are those radial muscles that will open the pupil because the nerves pull those radial motor units. And they're very fine, only about five fibres per unit. That's very, very low. But then you have the iris sphincter muscles. That's the, that's the circular ones uh, in the centre. You can't really see them in that, that picture. They're a bit hidden. But those circular ones, if they contract, it makes the pupil smaller uh, in bright uh, light. So they are the two muscles in the eye. But the point I want to make is that your you probably didn't know this, but your eye is full of these nerves. The nerves have to get everywhere in your body. And one muscle has many, many uh, nerves. So we've done a bit on senses and a bit on motors. Of course, what makes humans unique? Earlier I said every creature has a wonderful nervous system, but there's something particularly special about the human one. And what is particularly special about the human uh, nervous system is the brain. And many scientists are just in awe of the human brain. And I'll explain why. Let's compare the latest supercomputer. IBM, just a couple of years ago, built the Summit supercomputer. It fits in a very large building, bigger than this building, and it has a volume of a million cubic centimetres. How does that compare with the human brain, which is about a thousand cubic centimetres? Well, interestingly, if you compare the two, the electrical power you need to make the IBM Summit computer work is about 13 million watts. That's almost a million times greater than the human brain. How many calculations can the IBM supercomputer do? Well, it does a lot, about 0.2 billion billion per second. How does that compare with the human brain? The human brain is five times faster than the IBM supercomputer, and yet it requires one millionth of the electrical power to function. That is how stupendously efficient the human brain is, and it requires one thousandth the volume. And our memory storage is about 2.5 million gigabytes. Uh, I think I have a a one gigabyte memory stick here. Imagine 2.5 million of those. It would more than fill, in, fill this 
room. So our brains are incredible, even compared to the best of human technology. So the performance is just uh, staggering. You know, when I looked at these measures of performance, the, the verse that came to mind was, God does things we cannot comprehend. I cannot comprehend how God can do that. Because having looked at these staggering levels of performance, I then wanted to know what is the architecture of the human nervous system. This is what I really wanted to find out. How did God get a wire from here to here when there's 10 million of them? How did he do that? Because I've tried to do something very simple on a spacecraft and it was really hard, so I want to know how God did that. So i just give you uh, a few snippets of the architecture of the nervous system. The first slide is actually to do with the vertebral column. It's an amazing design, the, the design of our back, the, the vertebral column. The vertebral column protects the spinal cord. In fact, you can see the spinal cord goes down this hole, very well protected, and it actually lies behind the main vertebral discs. It's actually behind that if you look from the side. But what the vertebral column does, it gives you a very even spacing of the nerve roots. You have 31 pairs of nerves in the vertebral column, uh, 62 nerve roots, and they're coming out very evenly spaced. That's just what you want in an, a wiring system. You don't want too many wires in one place, so you get this lovely even spacing. But of course, the vertebral column does so many other things. It's a structural support for the body, it has these wonderful joints for bending. Not only is it stiff and strong, but it can, it can bend. Not so much as you get older, but when you're young it can bend quite a lot. You have cushioning of joints and you ha even have muscle attachment uh, points, which you can see on the left. So it's a wonderful multifunctioning uh, system, the vertebral column. <clears throat> but now I get into the detail of the wiring, because you see on the left, the picture of the brain, you have what's called the motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls the muscles. That's in red for notation. Then in blue, you can see the sensory cortex, the part of the brain that receives all the uh, senses, the messages from the sensors in the body. But what happens is you have to funnel all the connections from those two parts of the brain down into the spinal cord to get down into the body. Now the spinal cord is typically about 12 millimeters diameter, about just over one centimeter diameter. <clears throat> How does God get over 10 million signal pathways into a cable just over a centimeter diameter? I had a cable that's just over a centimetre diameter on my spacecraft and I had to get 400 wires into that and that was tricky. So how did God get 10 million signals into something that size? Then you look at, how, just this is a picture of one nerve root. I mentioned there were 31 pairs of nerve roots coming out of the spinal column. This is a picture of one nerve root. Root. Now I find this a fascinating picture as someone who's designed wiring systems because one nerve root is going to contain more than 100,000 signal pathways and one bundle that big is too big just to plug into the spinal cord. 100,000 wires is just too many. So look what happens. It's split into five or six sub bundles that very neatly then get put together. It's just as if an expert craftsman has put this uh, together. In fact, this is a picture of one of my wires on the left. And when I look at the spinal column uh, and I look at the wiring, I think, hang on, that looks just like what I was doing. It's just that there's a million more wires in there than I had on my system. Notice on this picture, <clears throat> the motor wires are separate to the signal wires, the blue and the red are kept separate because in the brain and in the spinal cord, the signals coming down are separate to the signals going up, which makes sense because the brain has different areas for motor signals, sensor 
uh, signals or motor instructions and sensor signals. But that creates a challenge because at some point all those need to be finely mixed together because if you look in one of the nerves in your body, your arms or your legs, you'll find there's a complete mixture of sensor signals and motor signals because when a nerve goes to your muscle, for example, you need both sensors and motor signals. And I've always wondered, where does the mixing take place? Well, I managed to find uh, some books and papers and amazingly, it takes place in a very short space of time. So here you have complete separation of the motor signals, sensor signals, and then as soon as you go along a few centimetres, it splits into complete mixing. Now what is happening in this small section, from an engineering point of view, is just miraculous because you have these complete separation, but then complete mixing of the motor and sensor signal. In engineering, we just could not do it that fast. How it happens in such a short space of time is amazing. So at the spinal cord, you have this separation of motor signals, sense signals, but not long after the nerve root, you have a complete mixing of all those uh, signals. It's quite amazing. Then you have the nerve branching. I mentioned before, 150,000 kilometers. How is that possible when we're not very big? Well, it's because you have intricate uh, branching of these nerves. Remember I was saying this is a section of skin, it's just a couple of millimetres uh, squared section of skin. But notice this nerve along here and notice it splits and you have this branching. If you add up all those branches to the different senses and whatever section of skin you've got, there are nerves all through your skin and by the time you add up all the details that the nerves do, it adds up to 150,000 kilometres of nerves. So there's a big difference between human engineering and what God has done. In the case of a spacecraft, the wires are not in most places. There's lots of places where there are no wires and a few places where there's wires. But in the human body, the wires reach every nook and cranny in the same way that blood vessels reach every nook and cranny. It has to to keep you alive. But engineers can't do that. They can't make wiring systems or plumbing systems just reach every cubic millimetre of a system. So another really remarkable feature. <clears throat> then we have precision design in nerve bundles. On the right hand side is an engineering bundle of wires. Looks very neat, but it's nothing in comparison to a cross-section of one of the nerves in your body. The nerves in your body is a great hierarchy of uh, nerves, many, many individual nerve lines. You have sheaths for protection. You, you have blood vessels getting into those nerves to give them a blood supply, uh, to keep them healthy, to do, uh, to do healing. It's an incredible design. Just one nerve bundle uh, is an incredible design. But then we get on to the integration of the nervous system. Uh, and, and this is really quite staggering. Integration is a difficult thing. Uh, when I was wiring a spacecraft, I would have to say to my colleagues, say the colleague designing the structures, and I would say, well, I'd just like to put a couple of holes in your beam because I've got to get from A to B. And they would tell me to go away. They, they didn't want me to put a hole in their beam. Um, wiring people are not very popular in engineering teams because you want to go through things, around things and squash things. Very difficult to integrate wiring in a system. But what is just staggering is, you see I've been saying 500,000 motor units. Here is a motor unit and it, you just have to realise that the nerve has to get into a muscle and it has to find has to get to its own motor unit. So you have all these, imagine you've got a muscle, if it has a hundred motor units, you have a hundred nerves getting into that muscle, 
fully integrated with that muscle, when you think of 500,000 motor units, you have 500,000 uh, challenges of integrating a nerve into that motor unit and you see how intricate uh, it is to get that nerve right into the muscle, right into the right place. It's just a staggering level of integration. You, you just need infinite knowledge to comprehend this or design it and of course God has infinite knowledge and, and he's done that. So just the muscle system and the integration of the nerves with that is just staggering. But then of course the nerves are integrated with the organs as well. So far I've been mostly talking about the voluntary nervous system but then there's the automatic uh, nervous system, uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic. A lot, a lot of what goes on in our body we're not doing consciously you know, when we digest food and the stomach muscles are going, uh, or when we're breathing and doing other things, a lot of things we're doing automatically, and so there's control involved there. But the point I'm making here is that you have this integration in the whole of the body. You also have the integration of the nervous system with the skeleton. Just to mention the biggest uh, nerve in the body, hopefully you don't have problems with your sciatic nerve, uh, because it's the longest one, it sometimes can cause problems if you've had accidents or illness. The longest axon, the longest nerve cell in the body is about one meter in length. It goes from your spinal column to your big toe. And even though it's 0.1 millimeter diameter, it's about a meter uh, in length. But notice how the, the nerve roots are going through the pelvis, it has to be integrated with those bones. Again, a type of integration. Another challenge with wiring systems is getting nerve bundles across moving joints. You know, when, when you're moving your elbow and your arm, you're probably not worried, what's this doing to my nerve bundle going across that joint? You just take it for granted. Uh, but it's amazing how much you can move your joints and your blood vessels and nerves will tolerate enormous movements of joints. I don't recommend you to try this amount of movement, but uh, your body is designed for extreme movements. If you look at some pictures like Gray's Anatomy, you'll see that the blood vessels and nerves are just put in the right place so that when you move your joints, uh, your, your nerves and blood vessels will be fine. Um, one of the things I wasn't expecting to find was very intricate nerve networking. It's called plexus. This is an example of brachial plexus. So what you can see on this diagram, uh, you see there are these nerve roots here. But uh, you might have thought this root will come out and just go to different places. But what you find is that even though these are different nerve roots, they then get connected to other nerve roots and it's called plexus or branching. So these separate nerves then join with other nerves. So what is the point of that? What's the advantage of different nerve roots connecting with neighboring nerve roots? Well, it's a brilliant design feature to give redundancy. If you injure very badly one of your your nerves, what you find is that uh, your nervous system can bypass that nerve and take a different route to the spinal column because you have this branching, it has different ways of routing from one place to another. So a brilliant uh, design feature, the kind of design feature that engineers try to copy when they're doing their wiring systems. And just one other feature of the architecture of the nervous system, I haven't mentioned much about the biochemical uh, design, molecular design on a microscopic level. But if you, if you do look into this, it's quite amazing. The intricate design, the protein design, the molecular machines involved in getting chemical signal transfers by diffusion between neurons. So you have not just electrical impulses, but chemical uh, uh, physical effects as well to get the signal transmission and the speed of transmission is very very fast throughout the whole 
body. So you can see these amazing design features in the architecture of the human nervous system. But I just want to get into an application uh, of this. And first of all, just to summarise the evidence for intelligent design. And one of them is what I call purposeful over-design. According to the theory of evolution, we are evolved just for survival. We would never have any ability uh, beyond what we need for survival. So according to the theory of evolution, in fact there are some books and papers on this, the reason for our hand is to form a fist and to punch someone in the face. That explains your hand, which is not a very good idea to tell children just before they go to the playground to do their playing. But that is what is taught in schools today. Another function of our hands, according to evolution, is to throw a spear uh, and to throw stones. Why is it? Well, this is Professor Stephen Jones, uh, a leading proponent of evolution, and I totally agree with his uh, description of evolution. Evolution does its job and no more. Uh, evolution would never evolve you to play the piano if you did not need to play the piano, which is why our great musical abilities are a great challenge to evolution. Just to give you one more example, this is Alice Roberts, Professor Alice Roberts. She said, our enormous brains has been something which has taxed paleontologists for decades and decades, and I think still taxes everyone in the field. How and why have we developed these enormous brains? So people who believe in evolution are just perplexed. Why are humans over-designed? Uh, you know, th there should be an explanation to everything. And of course, the explanation is we are designed for far more than survival. God has designed us for great things, not just for spiritual life, but he wants humans to be brilliant musicians and artists, creators like God himself. So it's interesting to see these admissions from the evolutionist. Design for more than survival. Just a couple of my favourite examples. Uh, an Indian, uh, Ravir Mina, in 2015 broke the world record. It took him 10 hours to recite from memory 70,000 decimal places of the number pi. The number pi has no pattern whatsoever. And this is just the first 40, 40 numbers. That's 40 numbers. You probably have trouble remembering that. But this Indian spent his whole life memorising 70,000. Um, just one other example. A nine-year-old child in Holland completed an electrical engineering degree. At the age of nine, completed it at Eindhoven University. Electrical engineering is a tough subject. You can ask Stephen Taylor. And he completed it at nine. Many examples you can give showing that humans are not descended from an ape-like uh, creature. But then there's irreducible complexity. These are examples of joints and subsystems where many parts are needed to be existing for that to function properly. You can't just add one at a time, one part at a time as Darwin thought. And it's certainly true of the nervous system that branching, uh, the wiring, the, the vertebral column. It's so intricate. Everything has to be there in one go. You can't just be adding on uh, one part at a time. Just to give you one other example, I love this one. Above the eye, there is this hook or sling, and the top muscle in the eye has to go through a little eye, get anchored through the eye. And it's a wonderful example of integration and irreducible uh, complexity. So, uh, just to give you some of my favourite examples. Uh, irreducible complexity, very important evidence for intelligent design. So the evidence absolutely supports biblical teaching. The psalmist David knew he was fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't have a PhD, he hadn't heard of the central nervous system, but he knew he was fearfully and wonderfully made just from playing the harp. Uh, just from stargazing and doing the other things that he did, he knew he was fearfully and wonderfully made. But today we have less excuse not to see the truth of that verse. And that verse I mentioned before, God does things we cannot comprehend. If you just look closely at any part of the human body, you have to 
uh, agree with that statement. We cannot comprehend God's work. In a final brief section, I want to look at the battle of world views. We've been thinking about that uh, today in the question time. Here are five examples of books by atheists claiming humans are badly designed. The most recent one in 2018, Nathan Lentz, and that they're evolutionists, they're actually humanists who are arguing that humans are badly designed. What is interesting, because I've looked at these books very closely, what is interesting is that they don't give any evidence uh, a, a, there's no real evidence at all that humans are badly designed. What they're basically saying is, if evolution is true, then we should be badly designed. And I do agree with that. If evolution is true, we would be a messy design and a bad design. The problem for evolutionists is that the evidence is that we are wonderfully designed and not badly designed. And as we've heard this morning several times, if we follow where the evidence leads, then we will not be humanists and evolutionists, but we will be believing in the Bible and the God of the Bible. But the reason for putting this up on the screen is, these are the books being given to students today. A-level students, degree students are being shown these books. And a number of people, instead of saying, these books argue that according to evolution we should be badly designed. They're turning it on its head and saying the evidence is that humans are badly designed. And that simply is not true. And if you read the books carefully, you see that is not true. But it's part of this spiritual battle. That is why the work of truth in science is so important. Because of this fake science which is going to our students. Atheists have claimed, uh, okay, here are th I'm going to put three quotes up about the human nervous system uh, because atheists claim the human nervous system is badly designed. Now, I hope I convinced you the human nervous system is such an awesomely fantastic design. We should just be in awe of God. Anyone who knows anything about design has to be in awe of that. And yet, Atheists will dare to say the human nervous system is badly designed. I mean, I find that as staggering as the, as the greatness of the human nervous system. Jerry Coyne, who, by the way, knows nothing about wiring, uh, he said he's a, a, an American who's a very a big popularizer of humanism. He said uh, one of nature's worst designs is shown by the recurrent laryngeal nerve in mammals including the human one. So he's pointing to the human nervous system and saying it's one, it's one of the worst examples you will see. And, that's, and students are being taught that. And what he's saying is completely wrong. Richard Dawkins, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is obviously a ridiculous detour. So according to Dawkins, who also hasn't done any wiring himself, he, he says it's bad. Richard Dawkins said the eye is the design of a complete idiot because of the way the eye is wired. I haven't got time to talk about the wiring of the eye, but it's a brilliant design. Engineers are trying to copy it, but students aren't told the truth. They're told that it's the design of a complete idiot. That is what students are taught. Uh, in case you hadn't heard of the laryngeal nerve, uh, there are two nerves that go to the larynx. One is in red, goes a short route. The other is in, I think it's purple, goes on a, like a detour going down. And uh, creationists have researched this. There are very logical reasons for that detour of the laryngeal nerve. In fact, this is a picture of one of my spacecraft. Uh, it's a picture of the solar array deployment arm. I've put 300 wires on the spacecraft and what you can see is a double loop. Those loops are almost identical in size to the human laryngeal nerve, except I've got two of them, not one of them. And I have those loops for very similar reasons as uh, the human laryngeal nerve has loops. For example, 
one of the reasons I have it, you can see it, you might be able to see a blue wire here and a red wire here. These wires, one's a temperature sensor, one's a proximity sensor, they could not go on their own. They had to piggyback another wire. And the same is done on the laryngeal nerve. There's a wire to the esophagus and a nerve to the trachea, and it has to piggyback on something and it piggybacks on there. I also had to put loops in my wires for assembly reasons and production reasons. And as a baby grows, the organs move apart. Uh, you do have to have a wiring system where as the baby grows, um, then wires do move apart. In my first lecture to students, when I'm teaching about wiring systems, my first lecture, I say, we often have loops in wiring systems. But Dawkins and Jerry Coyne have never gone to a lecture on wiring, so they make this uh, comment off the top of their head, oh, I think a loop is a bad thing. And then that is taught to students, and students think, ah, the human nervous system is badly designed because Dawkins has said that's a ridiculous detour, and he hasn't stopped to look at it to say, well, actually, uh, is it a good design or a bad design? I just want to give you another quote. This is an amazing quote by uh, a very good uh, anatomist at Cambridge. He wrote this in about 1900, and it's an amazing uh, quotation. So Alex McAllister, Christian, uh, eminent uh, professor at Cambridge, he said that it has been my experience that scientists' disbelief in Christianity, death and resurrection of our Saviour, is more prevalent amongst what I call the camp followers, not real scientists, like Thomas Huxley, rather than those who actually do science. It's the camp followers who are pushing and really what he went on to say is evolution in the, in the 19th century after Darwin was not pushed by real scientists like Maxwell, like Faraday, like Calvin, all fellows of the Royal Society, all Bible-believing Christians who did not like evolution. But evolution was pushed by the camp followers, some popul humanist popularizers. And is that not true today? All these people you can see on the screen are distinguished supporters of humanism. They're all connected with humanist societies. Dawkins was vice president of the British Humanist Society. Alice Roberts is the president of Humanists UK. Uh, Bill Nye connected with the American Association. Um, Brian Cox wrote a book. Uh, the Atheist Guide to uh, Christ uh, Christmas. The public think these are distinguished scientists. They're not distinguished scientists. They're not senior scientists. They are camp followers, humanists who have an agenda, who want to push it. If you look at the CV of Brian Cox, he's had about three PhD students. I have to judge people for promotion to professor and normally they would have at least 12 PhD students just to get to professor. At the moment I have my 23rd PhD student going through to graduation and yet the public think Brian Cox is this really senior scientist. Richard Dawkins uh, has 22 publications in biology. Professor would normally have something like 100 and the same with the other people. We have these junior scientists who've, who are the camp followers, who are the popularizers of science. And the reason they've gone for those posts is because they have a humanist agenda. So it is a real battle and that is why the work of truth in science is so important. Sorry, there is actually one more section, the very brief section. Uh, this is where it started. Julian Huxley, he was mentioned by that Cambridge professor this was a really key statement in 1942. Modern science must rule out special creation. This is what started everything. That's what was accepted. It's a mad statement because science is supposed to be open-minded, not closed-minded. But sadly, that's what modern science has done. This is the big 
mistake of modern science. Uh, it doesn't matter what the evidence is, you know, you've got to rule out God and special creation. Just a few months ago, in America, the Discovery Institute published a book, Cancelled Science, how uh, scientists get cancelled if they try to push intelligent design. I have a whole talk on this, in fact, um, through CMI, I have a talk on Thursday evening next week, and the whole talk is refusing to be silent, so I have a, a, a 50-minute talk on this one slide next Thursday, half past seven. Um, not allowing freedom of speech. I wrote a book, Hallmarks of Design, and uh, The Design and Origin of Man, and many letters were wrote to my university, to the Vice-Chancellor. Uh, one of them was from a fellow of the Royal Society. I just call him Professor Rex, but some of you would have heard of this person. And he said, our concern about Burgess is the, he puts Bristol University, he mentions it on his book. Now, I've got a book here by Alice Roberts, and it's called The Little Book of Humanism. She puts her Birmingham University qualification on her book. And Richard Dawkins puts his Oxford qualification, when, well, at least when he was at Oxford, on his book. But I'm not allowed to do that. I'm told if I want to write about design in nature, I have to not mention the fact that I'm an academic, not mention the fact that I'm a professor of engineering design, not mention the fact that I've published 40 papers on design in the natural world. I have to, I'm supposed to say I'm speaking in a personal capacity that I believe in a creator, uh, but I've refused to do that. Um, I, I will always put down my connection with Bristol University because that's what Alice Roberts does and that's what Richard Dawkins uh, does. So it's been a quite a battle and if you want to hear more, then tune in next Thursday, half past seven. Just look on the CMI uh, website. But, and uh, Andy's had similar pressures and battles, uh, but both Andy and I would say, we have had some wonderful opportunities through that. In fact, I've had lots of wonderful conversations with my colleagues at Bristol University, uh, a lot of non-Christian colleagues who've not been happy with the pressure that uh, Christians have been under. So it does give opportunities. A good opportunity I had last year, just before the pandemic, 31st of January 2020, there was a head teacher conference at Wells Cathedral, Inspirational Head Teacher Conference, with a hundred head teachers uh, from schools in the west of England, and I was asked to be the main speaker. I had two talks of two hours, and I spoke about biblical creation. Lots of bishops were there, Bishop of Bath and Wells, and a hundred head teachers. And the teachers were very, very, I was amazed, very receptive, surprised they hadn't heard this information before. I'm very keen to share this with the students. So there are some uh, great encouragements and opportunities. So final summary. The evidence for intelligent design, it's overwhelming. I think you knew that anyway. But incredibly, it's banned from academia. If Isaac Newton and Maxwell and Calvin were here today, they would just be astonished. They would just, they could not comprehend what's gone on. Uh, humanists are very influential. Alice Roberts, Richard Dawkins, uh, Steve Jones, but they will often masquerade as neutral scientists. They will not admit they have a humanist agenda. They will not admit their assumptions. And therefore, as I've said several times, truth in science has a crucial role to play. So thank you for your support of truth in science and keep praying for their work and supporting them. Thank you.